All right. Uh, and next up, we have our last talk before we have another bra uh, break block, hard to say. And uh, welcome, Aaron A. Reed. Hello. Hi. Uh, Aaron is a writer and game designer focused on helping game makers and players tell stories together. He's a multi-time Indiecade and IGF finalist and has spoken about digital storytelling at venues as diverse as Google, PAX, GamerX, and Worldcon. And he's the author of Adventure Games Playing the Outsider and an upcoming book on the history of text games. And you're here to talk about books in general and procedural novels in particular. Yes, that's right. Um, cool. So thank you so much for having me. Um, just FYI to Alexei or other moderators, I also have my screen set up so I won't be able to see like chat messages. So if something goes heinously wrong, uh, verbally tell me. <laughs> I am here and will pop in if anything goes wrong. Awesome. Much appreciated. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks so much to the Roguelike Celebration for having me back uh, and to the organizers for putting on this fantastic virtual event. I've been loving the hell out of it so far. Um, so who am I? Um, I'm a lapsed academic, a game designer, an occasional game historian, uh, but mostly I'm a writer. And you might know me from one of these projects, some of which I'll be talking about today. Uh, and as a writer, I approach procedural text projects with maybe different goals than some other people here. So first of all, the output of my games is generally sentences and paragraphs rather than, you know, something more visual. Um, but second, my biggest priority is always to tell a compelling story. And I'm interested in the ways code and generativity can enhance that experience rather than starting from an interesting system or gameplay mechanic and working backwards to a good story from there. So I want to talk today about eight lessons I've learned over a decade of doing kind of novel length procedural text projects. There's a lot to cover, so I'm going to jump right in. But I just want to say that these points are all descriptive of my own experiences, not necessarily proscriptive for you. I'm not saying everyone should do these things, especially if you're more on the roguelike side than the interactive narrative side. These are just kind of my personal milestones that have evolved my own design philosophy. So let's get to it. Uh, number one, simulate only what the story needs you to simulate. Lots of us here love simulationism. I do too. It's fun to play with simulations and it's even more fun to make them. But in my own work, I've learned that just simulating things for the sake of it without a strong sense of how that's helping to tell a story can be a distraction from focusing on what's going to best shape the narrative experience I want my players to have. So to illustrate this with a project of mine, I want to talk about text adventures or interactive fiction. These were my gateway drug into procedural storytelling. And these games are very simulationist. They drop you in an environment, uh, that describes what you see, let you say action by action what you're doing. They have a world model with rooms and objects and inventory and containment and light sources and locked doors and keys and all of this stuff. And it can be incredibly fun to play in those worlds when it all works. But quite often you run into limitations where the player's imagination sort of exceeds the boundaries of the author's simulation. So around 2005, I decided, as I think almost everyone does who gets into writing text adventures, that I was going to solve this problem by making this sort of uber text adventure that sort of simulated everything. It would have responses to anything you could possibly type. It would have a dynamic world you could explore every corner of. You could interact with everything. Your choices would really matter. The whole shebang. So uh, I ended up making this game. It was called Blue Lacuna. It took me four years to write. By the time I was finished, it was close to 400,000 words long. And it was at that point the biggest text adventure that had ever been written. Uh, I printed it into an 800 page book, mostly for my own amusement. And a good chunk of that book was code to describe the game setting of a tropical island in prose. And I went a little overboard with the world simulation. So I had a full day night cycle with 10 distinct lighting periods. So rooms at twilight would be described differently than at sunrise or mid morning. There was a moon that went through realistic phases and caused tides, which also changed room descriptions and what parts of the island were accessible. Each room had a numerical elevation, so that supported a scene where a tsunami hits the island and the water realistically rises. There was weather, there were ambient messages triggered by the weather, or the location, or the time of day, or what the tides were doing, or obscure combinations of all of those things. And people noticed almost none of that, or if they did, it wasn't really what they remembered. So when you look at this room description, you don't really realize or care if there's 18 different variations of it or that the trees are only swaying because there's a storm coming in or whatever. In fact, you don't really care about this location at all, except to the extent that it's a stage for something interesting to happen on. But what people did remember about Blue Lacuna was the other half of that giant tome, which was uh, the code built to simulate the game's main character, a castaway named Prog. So this is a word cloud of that 400,000 words of source text. And it's interesting that the most mentioned word is prog, the name of this character, and all of the other words that are even visible at the Zoom level are in Form 7 reserved words. So obviously this was a huge part of the final game. 
So at the time I started making this, I'd never really seen a character in a game that you could have a dynamic relationship with that grew and changed over the course of a novel length story. So I'd sort of, you know, loved uh, games like Emily Short's Galatea, whoops, that, um, you know, let you have these rich conversations with characters. But I wondered what it would be like to extend that kind of relationship with the character beyond a single scene. So what I built to enable this for Blue Lacuna was a library of dynamic conversations, uh, more than 100 of them, that weren't directly connected to each other, but could be triggered at random or based on the game state or various other things. And in each of those conversations, the player has the chance to make choices that alter their relationship with Prog, that central character, along one of several axes. So there was an affinity axis, how much he liked you or not. There was kind of a submission dominance axis, how much in control uh, of the relationship and the conversations he felt he was. And an axis where on one end, he was kind of having romantic feelings towards you. And on the other end, he was having more sort of paternal father figure feelings towards you. And based on your position on these various axes, the system would classify your relationship with Prog into one of 12 archetypes. So if he felt kind of paternal towards you, but didn't like you very much, and also kind of was frustrated that he wasn't really in control of what was happening, that translated to the bitter dad archetype. And the archetype Prog's in can affect his behavior, it can affect the way he talks to you, and it sometimes even shifts the direction of the plot, unlocking new options or forbidding others. And the end game has this pretty complex flowchart, this is actually only a part of it, based on what archetype Prog is in and sort of your previous choices leading up to the climax of the plot. So despite that core relationship system being much simpler than all my complex island simulation, this effort paid off much more in terms of people's emotional engagement. Uh, and you really do have the ability in Blue Lacuna to shape what you want the story to be about. Is it about Prog finding redemption through his friendship with you? Is it about the player becoming the hero and making the moral stand that Prog was too weak to ever make? Do you inspire him to become a better person or does he inspire you to? Your choices over time really do determine that. And the player can sense that, I think, more than they sense all the mechanisms behind the simulation of places and objects. And that really resonated with people. I haven't ever made another big immersive simulationist game, in part because I realized I'm less interested in immersing people in an environment than I am in making them feel an immediate connection to story and characters. And this is actually a really helpful realization because it's let me focus my energies since then on creating procedures that will enhance that aspect of the player's experience. So number two, remember and respect the player's choices. A little of this goes a long way. And so you saw a lot of Blue Lacuna's complexity is in honoring the past choices the players made. But I want to talk about another of my interactive novels uh, called Hollywood Visionary. So this is a 2015 project for choice of games. It's set in 1950s Hollywood. Uh, where you play a director of an upstart independent studio who gets caught up in the McCarthy era fear of communists and nonconformity and have to learn what you're willing to sacrifice to realize your dreams. So I was resistant for a long time to working in a sort of choice-based format because I'd always thought that it didn't offer players enough power of expression. But what I realized as I started building this was that even in that kind of format where the player's only ever choosing between fixed options, if enough of those choices build up over time and the game remembers them, they can cohere into something that feels unique and personal for each player. So in this game, you can make your own movie. And all these little choices you make about genre, about casting, do you want to cast big name actors or bit part uh, you know, uh, character actors? Do you want to cast some tour against type? Do you want to shoot in color or black and white? What kind of soundtrack do you want to have? How tight do you want the editing to be? All these little choices get remembered. Um, and often they come back in surprising ways, whether it's just a throwaway description of fake blood being mixed in the background if you're making a horror movie, or the game's villain using your weird editing decisions as evidence you're a subversive at a congressional hearing. So one of the things I'm most proud of about this game is that people still email me all the time to tell me about the movie they made in the game. And that's really cool to me because when I started the project, I didn't know if that was possible to give people that sense of creative ownership over something in a choice-based game. Um, and the other really cool thing about this is that you can use it uh, you know, multiple ways in the same game. So the same kind of technique I use in Hollywood Visionary um, for how you, what your character's public persona is, rather than sort of starting off with a single list of sort of N supported gender options, I wanted you to sort of all the time be making these individual choices about how you're performing yourself, whether it's choosing what your signature fashion stick is, but then later wearing something completely different to a big party, uh, saying what you want your friends to call you, but you want your business associates to call you something else, picking pronouns, accepting or rejecting labels, picking love interests, these are all kind of independent choices that really let you perform your character's identity and personality however the hell you want. And that's, to me, way more interesting than choosing a single option off a list. And it felt really appropriate for a story about having the freedom to express yourself even within a restrictive system. Number three, tell stories with players, not at them. 
Like in Hollywood Visionary, I want my players to feel like they're contributing something meaningful. Blue Lacuna tried to sort of brute force this by having mountains of content to respond to player choices, but I've experimented with other sorts of approaches. So my game 18 Cadence, uh, in this game, you explore a house at the address 18 Cadence Street across 100 years of history. So the house is built in the year 1900 and burns to the ground in the year 2000. And there's not really a story there in the traditional sense. There's just kind of all of these vignettes of the families that lived there, the little dramas they had, an oak tree that grows, cracks in the wall that spread, changing fashions and furniture and technology. And you explore by moving through space and time and seeing all these little things happen, right? And objects coming and going. You're not a character in the story. You sort of have this God's eye view. But where it gets more interesting is that you also have a workbench that you can drag any of this content onto. And you're sort of encouraged to assemble or manufacture a story out of this century of raw material. When you make a story, you can save it and share it in the cloud and browse other people's stories. And there's kind of a novel's worth of source material here, even though the stories people make are more sort of poem sized. So this project I felt really became a success for me when people started making stories that I had never thought of, that I didn't realize could be made out of that source material. And just a couple of my favorites, uh, this one is about a disgruntled housewife who's just kind of depicted endlessly taking mundane actions while the house just kind of oppressively exists around her. Uh, in this one, uh, people use the ability to sort of drag two pieces of text that didn't go together on top of each other to make these sort of surreal sentences like a brash ashtray smokes a last cigarette. Uh, this one just kind of contrasts two events from very different parts of the history. So in the 1950s, the little girl hides her diary under a loose floorboard. In the, 90, in the 1990s, a homeless man using the house for shelter finds it and kind of takes comfort, comfort from it over a long night. This person just pulled all these uh, sentences about people reading books over the house's history. Uh, and this person just overlaid all of these objects that were found in the kitchen. And this, to me, suggests like this e image of all of these echoes of thousands and thousands of meals that were made in this kitchen over the years. So this is very different from a lot of my other work. It's not really a game by a lot of definitions. There's no simulation and you don't really have a character and you can't change the state of the underlying story material. But it was a successful kind of edge case experiment in forcing the player to make meaning out of the story. Only by becoming a storyteller can you get to a satisfactory ending, quote unquote, to 18 Cadence. It's literally a story that's not going to tell itself. You have to collaborate with me to tell it. Number four, limiting the generative space can be more powerful than expanding it. So the tendency, I think, is always to want more out of our generative systems. In Hollywood Visionary, it felt like the more options to customize your movies or your character, the better. And in Blue Lacuna, the more options in conversation I wrote or the more unique reactions to player decisions always felt like the ideal goal. But even back in Blue Lacuna, I realized that more wasn't always better. So with Prog, I deliberately decided that paternal and romantic feelings should be the same axis because I just wasn't interested in telling creepy Oedipal stories, right? Um, but I think a better example of limiting the generative space is my most recent project, which is a procedural novel called Subcutanean. So this is in some ways the closest thing to a traditional novel of the projects I'm talking about today but it's also radically procedural. It's a horror novel uh, and also kind of a queer coming of age story about two friends with a complicated relationship who get trapped in this infinitely recursive basement that kind of multiplies everything that comes into it. People, emotions, even dimensions. So it's a book about alternate versions of yourself and parallel realities and being afraid you're stuck in the wrong one. And what makes it unique is that each copy is different. When you order the book from my website, a new version is generated from a possibility space that contains hundreds of alternate versions of sentences and even entire scenes. This is then automatically laid out, typeset, and uploaded to a print-on-demand service. So the seed used to generate your book is tracked in a database and is never used again, so no two copies are exactly alike. So this might sound kind of like a project from NanoGenmo, the National Novel Generation Month, uh, but it's actually much less generative than most of those projects tend to be. And for my purposes, that's really a good thing. So I had a very specific story I wanted to tell here about friendships and coming out and growing up. And I wanted that story to work for the reader across every single one of those different copies. I didn't want it to feel procedurally assembled. I wanted it to be as compelling and readable as any traditionally written novel. The difference was that I wanted you to share the same feeling as the main character, that there were other possibilities out there that you were missing, wondering what was happening in them, the knowledge that this isn't the only way the story could turn out. So I exerted a really tight control over the output here. There's no GPT or Markov chains or procedures that might produce unpredictable text. Instead, it was more uh, like hand sculpting a possibility space. 
So all of the variations are handwritten, and each time the book is rendered, it picks one possible pathway through each chapter. The chapters themselves move through a plot that's fixed in its overall shape, but varies in sometimes trivial, but sometimes crucial details with different secrets and revelations, different conflicts, different beats of character development, and different overall resolutions. So this was kind of another weird experiment from the sort of game's perspective. The player, quote unquote, here doesn't really have any, can't do anything at all, right? They don't make any decisions. They're just reading the aftermath of a bunch of offline procedures. But that really forced me to think about how to make those procedures produce something truly compelling, even without the allure of getting to operate them yourself. So at first, when I started writing this, I was writing all kinds of wild variations of scenes just because I could, and that seemed like the thing you're supposed to do when you're writing procedural text, right? But the more I revised, the more I trimmed down that possibility space to something cozier and more curated. I became most invested in the tiny, carefully positioned changes that said meaningful things about the characters, the possibility inherent in their troubled personalities or in the different directions their lives might have gone. So how does being introduced to a character with he was trying to quit smoking versus he kept trying to quit smoking change your perception of him? When can you leave out or add a single sentence that totally changes the way you feel about a scene? With most procedural text systems, you can easily get into trillions and trillions of possible combinations. But for this project, I realized it was fine to more carefully deploy the procedurality to moments where it really mattered. And that was far more interesting than just increasing the number of zeros on this meaningless number. Even within a highly restrained structure, there was still more than enough room for every reader to have a unique experience, one that lived up to the sort of higher standards I went in with. Subcutaneous has gotten really good reviews, and most of them are more excited about the story than the system that assembled it, which I think is great. And it's really common in reviews for people to say, I can't imagine the story happening any other way or something to that effect, even though they know that it actually can <laughs> and does. And I really can't think of a greater compliment than that. Number five, the more you understand the texture printing, the more interesting things you can do with it. So procedural text people work a lot with strings of text, right? And it's sometimes hard to remember that these are generally total gibberish to the systems deploying them. It's hard to collaborate with a system that has no idea when a piece of text is emotionally loaded or a joke or grammatically correct or indeed anything about it at all. But if your code does understand something, anything about the text it's got, that can be a massively useful multiplier on its capabilities. So sticking with subcutanean for a minute, as I mentioned, I'd written a lot of these sort of minor variations that at first seemed sort of meaningless. Like, why would you care which version of this sentence gets picked? And at one point, I was tempted to just cut all of these. But then I thought of something much better to do with them, which was to treat them as tools for characterizing a particular narrator. So I plugged in some simple lexical analysis tools that could tell me, for instance, that one of these variants has more negative sentiment than the others. I could then define a chance for each generated subcutanean to have a narrator who was kind of a pessimist and would prefer variants with negative sentiment. Other narrators might be based on anything else we could glean from an analysis of the text. Narrators who like to use color words, who like to use or avoid simile, narrators who prefer or dislike alliteration, or try to avoid the passive voice, who like to ramble on or prefer the shortest way of saying something. Assembling a random team of narrators for each book now means a choice like this isn't just a roll of the dice, it becomes a way of consistently characterizing each possible version of the narrator of the story, giving each book a consistent voice. I used the technique or variation of it in a lot of my projects. In 18 Cadence, the sentences you drag onto the workbench have an understanding of what part of the history they're referring to. So they're not just that string of text, they have structured data. And this lets me do neat things, like when two fragments about the same person get close enough to each other, the second one replaces their name with the pronoun. And if you reposition again, the pronoun repositions itself too. The system knows how to write sentences about combinations of fragments. So if the user drags two from the same scene together, uh, they have hidden knowledge about what surface they're on, which means they can be smartly grouped in these descriptions when it makes sense for them to be. And all of these things are very minor, but they just sort of make the experience of playing with 18 Cadence fragments more immediate than just dragging around fridge magnets. It gives kind of an inkling that the system is working with you. It's reaching out a hand to help you tell the story you want to tell. And if I can introduce one more procedural novel to this overfull talk, let me briefly describe Icebound, a collaboration with Jacob Garby. In Icebound, you used both a physical printed book and a digital game to explore the unfinished manuscript of a long dead author who's been brought back to life in a not too distant future as an AI simulation. In the game, you collaborate with this digital ghost to explore different ways his story of doomed polar explorers might have ended. 
There was a lot going on in this project that I don't have time to get into, but part of the gameplay involved dragging lights into story sockets to activate them and make the element they connected to provisionally part of the story draft. And what was cool is that each of these was tagged with themes that were important in your digital collaborator's life, dedication or family or fragility, for instance. And this allowed the character in the game to have an intelligent conversation with the player about the story they were building together, noticing if they were consistently emphasizing a certain theme, using two contrasting themes together, ignoring something that he thinks is actually really important. So the player isn't just toggling arbitrary strings of text on and off here, they're actually manipulating a narrative machine. And that makes the experience much more meaningful. Number six, procedural stories don't have to be immersive. In Icebound, you're not a character embedded in the narrative. You're more like an editor viewing the whole of a manuscript from a high level and making executive decisions about it. So part of the mechanics are that dragging the symbols around immediately shows you how the consequences ripple through the whole story from beginning to end. The conventional wisdom, of course, is that immersion in a fictional world is sort of always the desired goal, but it doesn't have to be the only goal. My old advisor, Michael Matias, has argued that immersion can actually be bad for game stories because it makes you less able to perceive and appreciate the pleasingly multilinear aspects of an emergent narrative. You're engaged with Icebound on a different level than if it were, say, a text adventure set in Karina Station where you were the hero. And for the kind of story we wanted to tell, which was kind of a story about stories, that was a good thing. And the sense of being apart from the story is also seen in 18 Cadence. And I don't think it makes the story less powerful, maybe actually the reverse, because you have this God's eye view of how all these people's lives intersected and echoed each other in this poignant way that none of the characters ever individually appreciated. Now, you can say that in both these cases, you're just you're sort of immersed, but like on a different level, right? You're kind of more like a detective or an editor in a frame story rather than in the internal story. But I think it's a useful exercise with procedural narrative to think outside the box and question whether there are other modalities than traditional immersion that you can give players interacting with your text. Number seven, two to go. Uh, give the writer the best tools to write, even if the writer is yourself. Uh, I'm very on board Kate Compton's DSL train. Domain-specific languages are absolutely the way to interact with procedural text, uh, especially combined with syntax highlighters or other tools that make them even easier to deploy. So this was some of the code for 18 Cadence. Uh, uh, it was almost exactly like writing a manuscript, except that there were just certain kind of phrases that the system can understand. So this first paragraph has none of those phrases, so it's just treated like a comment. In this paragraph, uh, I'm saying in a year, in a location, and it understands that that means these are things that these characters were doing there and then. Uh, down here at the bottom, I'm defining an object that existed at a certain time and place. And this, this just made, it turned what could have been wrangling with a database or a spreadsheet into just writing a manuscript. Like I, I literally did not have to think about the code or structure at all. I could just sort of tell this story, but it was crucially, I was telling it in a way that my game could understand. Uh, similarly in Subcutanean, I made this very simple DSL for defining uh, text alternatives um, where again, I could just spend the vast majority of my time not worrying about syntax, but just worrying about the words. Um, and part of the reason I was able to finish Blue Lacuna at all was because of a domain-specific language I did not write. Uh, Graham Nelson and Emily Short created this language in Form 7 15 years ago, which is an incredible language uh, that I ended up liking so much I wrote a whole book on it. Um, and one of the things that's beautiful about Inform 7 is it lets you write even very complex kind of logic and character behaviors in this high-level natural language syntax. And that helped me so much during Blue Lacuna to sort of keep my writer brain active even while doing this kind of complicated coding and debugging. So DSLs are uh, what you need. Um, finally, number eight, show the seams. When I started uh, doing this kind of stuff, I wanted those seamless sentences like in Blue Lacuna where the curtain was firmly in place and the text just seemed to magically be right for any situation. I didn't want to break people's immersion. But over time, I've come to strongly believe this is actually the wrong way to write procedural text. Just like immersion can maybe sometimes be overrated, uh, with procedural writing, you really want people to appreciate the seams. So in Icebound, you can view the text associated with any symbol, and a lot of the details vary based on what other symbols are active and what themes you've emphasized. But no one really noticed or appreciated this until we added a mode that would show you the text that could vary, and also let you tap it to show the reason uh, that it was rendered the way it was. Suddenly, this text became not just a series of strings, but a window into how your actions were affecting the collaboration you were supposed to be part of. They were something the player could engage with, even play with, rather than just passively read. So ignore this advice when you don't want to draw attention to the procedurality, which is valid, 
But I really believe that for many procedural text projects, showing the seams is a vital part of the presentation of this art form, just as good acoustics are for music or clear diction is for public speaking. So to conclude, simulate only what the story needs you to simulate. Remember and respect the player's choices. Tell stories with players, not at them. Limiting the generative space can be more powerful than expanding it. The more you understand the text you're printing, the more interesting things you can do with it. Procedural stories don't have to be immersive. Give the writer the best tools to write and show the seams. You can find links to most of my projects on my website, aaronareed.net, or find me on Twitter at aaronareed. The website is also the place to find out where you can get your own subcutanean. Those are still available. And sign up to my mailing list to get notified about my next projects. Uh, I think a lot of people here will be super excited by a book I'm working on. That'll be uh, probably crowdfunding early next year uh, about the history of text games. Uh, so sign up for the mailing list if you want to be the first to hear about that. Thank you so much for having me, and I am happy to take some questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, and we do have some questions, and uh, people want to add more, then throw those in, but we have some right away. One is, can you say more about the system that goes from an order to a book? What kind of services are you using? Are there any gotchas there? Yeah, so um, I gave another talk about Subcutanean at the Electronic Literature Conference a few months ago. And in that, I said that, uh, ironically, the hardest part of that whole project was the distribution, like <laughs> figuring out how to print it and get it into other people's hands. And the biggest issue there is that the vast majority of print, uh, print on demand services require human review of any change to a manuscript because oh, they want to avoid the situation where you upload like a corrupted PDF and then someone gets that and then they complain to the printer, right? Uh, but that means that uh, any time someone ordered a subcutanean, it would like kick the whole project into like human review mode for like 48 to 72 hours. So that wasn't going to work. So like from the very beginning, I had this very limited subset of services I could use to realize this project. And then there's also all these problems with distribution where like so many book reviewers will only cover a book that's listed on Amazon, but Amazon requires your book to have an ISBN. And you also have to get a new ISBN every time you change the text of the book. So there were just all, it was a logistical nightmare to figure out how to actually realize that project. Right. And it's funny because it's not interesting to talk about, like the technical stuff is what's interesting, but that right. was actually the hardest part of that project. So huh. it was uh, quite a journey. Yeah, well, that ties really perfectly, almost as if it was planned. It wasn't, but into the next point, which is someone asked, uh, how do you handle copyright and license in Subcutanean? Is the legal apparatus ready for procedural novels? It sounds like certainly the book production apparatus is not. Yeah, it is absolutely not. Um, I suppose I could, you know, like copyright the code or something, but um, it wasn't sort of practically uh, an issue for me because my sort of dominant model with my projects tends to be I release stuff for free and then if you like it, ask you to buy the official version. Um, so you can actually read like one version of Subcutanean, at least all online, and I'm in intending to open source the code eventually. Um, so I wasn't super practically worried about it because I didn't really think, you know, uh, the sort of queer procedurally generated horror novel was going to be like, you know, the latest hot IP that people were going to try to steal from me. So, we can hope, but yeah, I mean, you know, anything's possible. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's like the, the whole, the whole legal and book printing ecosystems are totally still not ready for procedural text, even though it's been around for decades now, which is a shame. Yeah. There's one last question. Uh, what sort of tools did you use to generate heuristics for narrators making choices on what sentence variant to use? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so it was mostly very um, guided by sort of my gut instinct. I didn't do a lot of sort of like uh, science to come up with those. It was mostly just as I was writing variations, I would start it, start noticing things like, oh, it feels like some of the time when I write this, I want to be kind of snarky, but other times I don't. So maybe actually that's a narrator is like, you know, one that plugs into a sarcasm detector or something. I didn't actually build that one, but, right. but it, it would be those little differences I would notice in like, as I was projecting myself into this space of possible ways I could write this and then thinking like, oh, that one would be easy to carve off because like there's a, you know, Python function in this text analysis library I could use that would detect those kind of sentences, right? So it's kind of a combination of knowing what tech I had available and noticing the ways I was writing things. Well, that's cool. I mean, I, I, I'm i a big fan of those ways that, you know, you don't need to build a, a tool for every heuristic. You didn't need to use an AI for it. You're involved in that process as a creator, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Wonderful talk. Hopefully people can find you in the space, ask you yep. more questions later. I'll be around. All right, perfect.